Nancy Dale has been a professional massage therapist and member of the AMTA since 1974. <laughs> Last year, where, received, where she received her 40 year pen. Awesome. Nancy is the founder and the director of the Downey School of Massage in Wallaboro, Maine, since 1980. A leading, her, leader in her field, she has served on the AMTA National Board, numerous committees, and was the charter president of the Maine AMTA chapter. Nancy has taught and presents workshops internationally, is certified in orthopedic and sports massage, and has developed the working philosophy of dimensional massage. She is lead author of Kinesiology for Manual Therapies, published by McGraw-Hill. Her BA in Health, Arts, and Science from Goddard College helps her balance her administrative duties as director with teaching dimensional massage advanced skills, kinesiology, and let me tell you, when I went to school, I dreaded kinesiology day. I didn't do so hot. And related subjects at DSM. Nancy enjoys her therapeutic practice for her clientele, traveling and teaching, and playing with her two grandchildren whenever possible at her home in Walderboro. Nancy has provided the good citizens of Maine over 860 outstanding massage therapists. In Nancy's effort to, in Nancy's effort to provide her students and past graduates with, a better, with better skills, she has brought in over 30 continuing education providers, many of whom are graduates from her own school. Nancy graduated from the J. Victor Schrar Academy of Physiotherapy and Scientific Manipulation on September 15, 1974. Her AMTA membership certificate to practice massage is dated 1977. The AMTA certificate to teach massage is dated 1981. She doesn't know that I know this, but she is a bit of a workaholic. <laughs> but it hasn't always been that way. In the early 1970s, I found this is my whole speech. <laughs> In the early 1970s, she was asked to leave and not come back Tampa University because she protested and refused to be held to a curfew. <laughs> what led her to massage school in New Mexico. <laughs> Riding horses and trading jewelry with the Indians and going to massage school at night. This is also where she designed and painted the DSM logo before she knew it was going to be with her forever. It was just a painting she made back then. Her mother, Mildred Emily Waltz, was the first pilot, male or female, to graduate from Boston University. She was a bookkeeper for what is now Barnes, Barnstable Municipal Airport in Hyannis, Massachusetts. Millie also had flaming red hair and flew with the Women's Aviation Group. The 99s. It's interesting. It's interesting, Amelia Earhart also belonged to the 99s and flew out of Hyannis and had red hair, and her nickname was Millie. <laughs> pretty, pretty safe to say they knew each other and flew together. That was in 1928. Nancy's mother flew planes during time when women were told that home was the limit. In true redhead fashion, <laughs> her mother took to the skies and followed her dreams. She passed away the same year Nancy got her massage diploma in 1974. Nancy has always told her kids that they can do anything. She tells this to her massage students also. There is no limit, just do, be, and live. So it's my honor and great privilege to introduce Nancy, a woman I have looked up to and loved for the past 22 years. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Nancy Dale. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> said anything yet. <laughs> so where is Jill? There we go. Oh, okay. Can you see me? I've never been very dull. <laughs> you know, the very one of the uh, conventions that I went to um, years ago in Washington, D.C., there was about a thousand massage therapists there. It was an AMTA convention. And the keynote speaker got up on a table and she just stood there. And the room got quieter and quieter. And everybody was wondering, what the hell is she going to do? <laughs> and when you could just barely hear a pin drop in the room. She said, have I got your listening yet? I've always remembered that when I've done presentations around the world. And uh, it serves, serves you well, I think. It, was, it made an impact on me. I want to thank Emily Rice and Jill Moran and the conference committee for all the hard work that they've done organizing this conference. And also, I want to recognize the individuals that have served on past conference committees over the years. You have given a legacy of service to our region and to the profession. Let me also say that it is not possible in this keynote to acknowledge everyone who has left a legacy to this profession. So if I do not personally mention you at this time, it's not because you have not given enough to the profession. What we have done together over the years has been a serious amount of teamwork. I have been personally blessed to have so many wonderful peers in my life this has given me more than the projects we have took to task. These people are all golden in my book and irreplaceable by time. What history remembers and what we remember as we live it are two different streets. I am in the process of reviewing a book for massage therapy. It's a history book currently. And I recently read a chapter on the time period that I have lived. What the author wrote and what I remember as important are two different perspectives. And when I brought those points up to the publisher, she said, you bring up valid points, Nancy. What that will mean in the end is really going to be up to the interpretation of both the author and the publisher. But I thought it was really interesting. And I think this is partially the interesting thing about our profession. The artistry and the craft and how we incorporate the science is so subjective that when we stop doing massage or pass on, our work not always evolves. Often, history tells us we have to reinvent techniques and modalities. Our individual legacies, therefore, are extremely important to the history of massage. Most people, when you ask them, what is your legacy, they respond with, well, my children, land, physical things that can be passed on, until they think beyond the monetary, to what we are, or the contributions that we have made while you are alive. I would be terribly remiss not to mention my children, all three, 
who are licensed massage therapists. And of course, those are my beautiful grandchildren. So what is your legacy? How does one create a legacy? Legacy is defined as something received from an ancestor or predecessor or from the past. That's from Webster. Gift, land, bequest, inheritance, or heritage. It also means how someone is remembered and what contributions they made while they were alive. Professional legacy, short term or long term, is different from your personal legacy. Alyssa Haynes said, my legacy so far is probably a lot like most of my colleagues. People who sleep better, people with less pain, a kid with sensory issues who now hugs his mom, people who have more to give their families and jobs and passions because they feel better. That was really, that was in caps. Your professional practice is providing a memory to all your clients. I love massaging massage therapists. Their bodies are so in tune with receiving massage that your hands can hear the relaxation of tissues almost as soon as you touch them. You kind of melt into the table, right? Our skilled professional touch is leaving a legacy of healing to countless clients on a regular basis. There's also another definition of legacy. It's an adjective denoting software or hardware that has been superseded but is difficult to replace because of its wide use. That was a surprise to me. It was made so well, it is hard to replace. What if we did our job so well, massage therapy as a whole was irreplaceable? In the last year or so that I've been contemplating this question, I've also looked at why I became a massage therapist and what things I've derived from the experience. And I've asked my friends similar questions and had them think of it. David Lauderstein thought about it for a while, and then he said, why did I choose the life of a massage therapist? And this is what he came up with. He got to learn how to touch people in a way that sometimes made a profound difference in their lives. He got to learn anatomy that helped him, his clients, and students understand how their bodies work. He got to learn how to move in a way that is both graceful and strong. He got to learn physiology that reveals the miraculous processes in the body and the mind. He got to work with fascinating array of clients, from spiritual teachers to bookies, to dancers and bus drivers, actors to day traders, psychologists, politicians, musical and martial artists, and marital counselors. He got to start a school 25 years ago, which helped him reach out and touch through his grads hundreds of thousands of people we would otherwise never have touched. So Pete Whitridge, how many schools do we have in the country? 1,100. 1,100. Now, think back 25, 30, 35 years ago and how many schools we've had in the interim how many students have graduated from there, and how many people have been touched because of that in a safe and compassionate manner. David also said he got to study with some of the most brilliant, imaginative teachers in the world, Rolfer Ralph, Daniel Blake, Dr. Fritz Smith, Paul Brown, Bob King, and so many others. He said he got to feel every day that he didn't need to question the worth of what he did. He got to receive bodywork sessions that triggered experiences that were so close to enlightenment as he would ever come. 
And he got to meet what must be the kindest, brightest, most hopeful people there, there may be in any profession, massage students and therapists. He got to feel, no matter what missteps the world seemed to make around him, that he was on the path that is absolutely positive for himself and for others. He said, there is no good reason to persist in work that makes one less than happy. And there is every reason to begin, now rather than later, a happier, healthier life. I thank David for all of that huge piece that he wrote. I'm very fond of Thomas More in his book, Care of the Soul. He said, in a sense, all work is a vocation a calling from a place that is a source of meaning and identity, the roots of which lie beyond human intention and interpretation. To me, massage therapy is a calling. It makes me happy on a daily basis. I believe in safe touch. I believe it will reduce violence. I think massage therapy provides us an avenue for security that we perhaps have been missing over the years. Okay, that's me. <laughs> so in the 70s, I did attend, um, I was a hippie. <laughs> I totally confess it. And at one point, I had 14 horses and backpacked them into the Carson National Forest. And I received my first massage in 1972 from Dr. J. Victor Shear. What happened was I came into contact, pretty close contact, with the front of a horse's hoof uh, that connected with my skull, fractured my skull and my nose and uh, gave me a pretty good concussion, two raccoon eyes and headaches for the rest of my life. So I went to Jay specifically because of the headaches, but I was quickly intrigued by massage therapy, his school, his hands, his touch, and his healing aura that surrounded the school and permeated the environment. There was purple light everywhere. Literally. Jay was an old school therapist, and he gave me my first neck adjustment. That was part of the massage treatment. After the massage, I felt transformed, and I had this destiny moment, a glimpse of my future as a massage therapist. And that was a challenge in Santa Fe, New Mexico. It was filled with a transient society in the early 70s. I went to class at night, and it was $5 a night, and every class was a different bunch of people. And I persevered, and shortly Jay realized that I had not left. <laughs> and I really wanted a diploma and a career as a massage therapist. And during the day, I studied with Sensei Nakazono, Aikido taught me balance and was a basis for understanding body mechanics and moving around the massage table. Medicine classes included the five element theory, acupuncture, acupressure, and meridians. I knew I was in the right place when I learned that my teachers exchanged treatments with each other. For me, this experience was the foundation of my career, my practice, the seeds of founding a school, in investing in a profession and my future. Jay was also not just my teacher, but he, he planned my future. And when he literally took me under his wing, he seriously took me under his wing. So when he said, you're going to this convention in the AMTA in Scottsdale, Arizona in 1974, I said, yes, Jay. And I took the RMT exam, and there I met other individuals who had been caretaking the profession from the 40s when the AMTA was first organized. 
it struck me that there was a huge age difference between me and them. And it didn't matter. They embraced me before I even knew it. I was secretary of the Massachusetts chapter for three and a half years. I bet you didn't know that Massachusetts chapter. <laughs> Perry Plouffe was responsible for that. You only have to look around you to understand her legacy to our profession as national president, leader, and massage therapist, and conference organizer. I also met Ruth Williams, who told me the reason we learn Swedish massage as a foundation is because there is hardly another modality that does not have some form of Swedish technique in it. Ruth was an educator, school owner, leader, author, and gifted massage therapist. We enjoy the field of massage therapy today because of her legacy and others like Jay Shear, Perry, and Sensei, who laid a foundation for us to build on. That very first convention taught me that massage therapy was a huge profession and that education embraced the whole field. The excitement at the convention was electric and contagious at the same time. I left enthused by the education and impressed by the educators who had caretaken the profession to that pivotal time. I had to wrap up my New Mexico education in 1974 as my mom was dying with cancer. Sensei took me aside before I left and told me I would not be able to save her. He helped me accept her illness and prepared me for the inevitable. I had thought I would be able to care for her for a while, but she died the day after I arrived home while I was in the Boston hospital. I remember I was afraid in the end to touch her. She was so sick. That is one reason why I'm so grateful to the Society for Oncology Massage for their work today. Tracy Walton comes to teach oncology massage at DSM every other year. And as a part of that, we have a clinic open to the public for survivors and individuals who are struggling with cancer. This last October, I was moved by the clinic and I wrote a poem about the experience. In memory of Kate Waltz Hickson, Nancy's best friend. Thank you, Jill. I couldn't say that myself. This is called If the Walls Could Talk. If the walls could talk, the paint would weep. Pain, frustration, and cry relief that compassionate touch provides. Relief to let go, not fight. To freely absorb nurturing energy to somehow regain, refresh, renew, to arise with enough fight to be a warrior again. If the walls could talk, they would reflect the joy of peace, a bright light bouncing off auras, souls vibrating, frequencies, a quiet hum. Therapists bolster, quietly support with grace strength, a soft touch, a soothing hand only giving without judgment. If the walls could talk, they would witness the miracle of transformation, pain reduced or dispelled, frustration expired, worry becoming mist, anxiety dissipating. The air so heavy from fear evaporates, changes, melts, frowns develop into a relaxed visage a smile emerges, and for a time, relief embraces clients. Therapists sigh, the work is done. If the walls could talk, they would say, well done. I cannot express how appreciative I am for Tracy's work as an educator, massage therapist, author, and expert listener. Her legacy is huge for the profession, and she is still working on it. 
Therapists that take this continued education are working and volunteering their time, giving a legacy of touch in, in hospitals and practices all over the country. The Society for Oncology Massage is a wonderful organization and they will need help furthering their goals. Hint, hint. After my mom died, I moved to Maine and started my practice. I also became an EMT, served on the ambulance service, made inroads with, with physicians in the ER and OR, worked for two chiropractors, and for years traveled to AMTA events and meetings in Massachusetts and New England. I've been hooked on conferences and conventions ever since the first one in 1974. One of the messages I got from my massage training is that you can never stop learning. Once you stop seeking education, you lose perspective of who you are and your purpose. Retaining humility allows you to listen to other human beings and helps you to be the vehicle of their journey. We are not their journey. Thomas More says, when the soul is involved or inner self, work is not carried out by the ego alone. It arises from a deeper place and therefore is not deprived of passion, spontaneity, and grace. I've always believed that massage is an art and science, and that it's used by the massage therapist to encourage balance and well-being in the individual. It's the responsibility of the individual to heal him or herself. Education has been a primary directive for me. I've studied with Jack Marr, Benny Vaughn, Ruth Williams, Paul St. John, Rich Fay, Bob King, Upledger, John Upledger, Jim Hackett, Elliot Green, Jackson Petersburg, David Lauderstein, Dr. Hancock, Whitney Lowe, and so many more. I can't even name them. I've embraced connective tissue massage, myofascial, neuromuscular therapy, cranial sacral therapy, acupuncture, shiatsu, polarity, therapeutic touch, applied kinesiology, body, mind, and energy work, research, lomi lomi, welfing. Uh, movement therapy, sports massage, orthopedic massage, and I continue to study the structure and function of the human body. I've developed my own working philosophy of dimensional massage therapy, which I'm teaching tomorrow. This journey helped me found the Downey School of Massage 35 years ago. The main AMTA chapter, the AMTA Council of Schools, the original AMTA sports massage team, and my investment in education of the field as well as 10 years on the New England Conference Committee, the first 10. <laughs> my journey has given me peers that I highly respect and bonded with over working for the profession. I cannot express how meaningful it was to be on the AMTA National Board with Bob King, Elliot Green, and others to create standards with Sally Neiman, Ruth Marion, Iris Berman, Catherine Hansman Spice, Margaret Avery Moon, and Steve Kitts for Compta, or to work on on site teams. Another opportunity. Compta always needs on-site evaluators and commissioners. Hint, hint. I presented to physicians, hospitals, colleges, nurses, peers, and to the public all over the world. It took me four years, but I did write a book, Kinesiology for Manual Therapies, and I produced a gift to touch, a teaching DVD. I continue to travel and teach, run the school, and practice massage. I love my practice. Now, I serve as a committee chair for the Alliance for Massage Therapy Education. It's an organization comprised of schools, administrators, faculty, and CE providers. It's probably no surprise I plan their conferences. 
This year, we're going to make history by inviting multiple stakeholder organizations to come together to collaborate for the profession. In July, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, we're holding the first Educational Congress. I'm excited to be part of this amazing event and legacy. Pete Wittridge, the current president of the Alliance, is himself a teacher and CE provider. I want to thank Pete. Please stand up. I want to thank Pete for his devotion to this great field of massage and to his contributions to massage education and to the Alliance. Thank you, Pete. To serve as a chapter officer, a committee chair, or strive to be on an association board to teach, to present to the public, to write, research, practice, or to touch safely. These are the mechanisms to develop your legacies. I have another poem. This one is by Ralph Waldo Emerson. To laugh often and love much, to win the respect of intelligent persons and the affection of children, to earn the approbation of honest critics and to endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to give up oneself, to leave the world a little better, whether by a healthy child, a garden patch, or a redeemed social condition, to have played and laughed with enthusiasm and sung with exaltation, to know that even one life has breathed easier because you have lived. This is to have succeeded. The New England Conference has succeeded in leaving a legacy of healing. Being at this event has touched our hearts, educated us, allowed us to mingle with our peers, and to explore new and old products one-on-one -on -one with the vendors of our field. It has birthed ideas, fueled our hearts with enthusiasm, and taught us that continued education is a very big part of our profession. It has given us a true sense of accomplishment from putting on a successful conference to laying this legacy of healing. It has whisked us away from the isolation of practice helped us prevent burnout, and given us the opportunity to share our ethical dilemmas. So I ask you again, what is your legacy? For you are the future of this profession. You get to make the choices that will fulfill your journey. You will have a legacy of touch just by your investment in your practice. But what else can you do? What can we do together to further this profession? For me, I'm not done yet. I hope to continue to make history. That's my mom. She was one of the first women to fly, and that picture was taken actually in 1930. She did fly with Amelia Earhart. She was secretary for the Hyannis Airport while she attended Boston University. She used to take the train from 1926 to 1930. Her legacy to me, like Michael said, was to teach me that you can do what you want to do in life. You just have to do it. We are all pioneers in one of the greatest professions there is. So I urge you to create your legacy to leave to the profession of massage therapy. And remember that this is your journey. But sometimes you might need a romance. So I have a few suggestions. One is to start small. Involve yourself in taking continued education. The next is to find a mentor who can help you see the forest through the trees. 
That's Benny Vaughn, one of my greatest mentors, and Tim Agno, who's my co-author. Involve yourself in your state chapter. Join a committee or a national committee. Look at how you can further massage in your community or in your state. That, by the way, is Mark Beck. And after he became paralyzed, he continued to write a book. Make a five-year plan. Look at your life as a journey and plan your route. Ask yourself, why am I in this profession? And what can I do to further the profession? Start small. You don't have to be the president, the national president, tomorrow, either in your state chapter or the national board. Do you want to teach? I have to say, if you really want to learn something, teach it. I would look into the standards for teaching from the Alliance for Massage Therapy Education. Take those courses that will prepare you to teach. They have a conference. Surround yourself with individuals who are visionary. Link yourself to a school that supports standards, provides CE hours, and supports graduates. Reach out and meet your peers. These are people of like minds. Research massage. The Massage Therapy Foundation has provided us with the mechanisms of research, another wonderful organization to investigate, and they have conferences. Hint, hint. Right. The Alliance has many members who are authors and publishers that attend the conferences. This is actually a picture of all the authors. I couldn't get them all in the same frame that were there. Authors are giving. You do not have to start out writing a book. You can review books for publishing companies, keep a journal, and write articles. Write a newsletter to your clients. Present about massage. I teach a class at DSM called the Art of Presentation, Public Presentation. It's a fun class, the students all love it. They hate to present, but um, there is an art in doing it and presenting and getting up in front of a group. It's a great way to market yourself and to do some institutional advertising for the profession of massage. And I know I'm speaking to a group that loves to get massage, but get massage yourself. Attend ethic classes and share your experience with your peers. Embrace your, your passion and explore expansion. Remember self-care and prevent burnout. That's Cherie's pool, Pete. Whatever you do, remember that massage therapy provides a social service that is unquestionably valuable to the human race. Massage therapy provides a social service that is unquestionably valuable to the human race. Never doubt that. Be proud to be a massage therapist. This is a wonderful, satisfying career. Enjoy the ride and give back. Create your legacy. I'm going to end with a poem found on Facebook. I find a lot of stuff on Facebook. I offer you peace. I offer you love. I offer you friendship. I see your beauty. I hear your need. I feel your feelings. My wisdom flows from the highest source. I salute that source in you. Let us work together. Thank you.